Prologue Scratched, slender hands pulled at the leather-bound books upon the shelves. Some toppled to the floor, while others were tossed over a shoulder. Once it was cleared, palms struck the back of the bookcase several times and caused numerous panels to spring open. Both hands then delved into the revealed nooks, only to discover they were bare. Undeterred, Mr. Percy Locke stepped onto a footstool and swept his arm across the bookcase's dust-laden top. For the second time, though, his search yielded no results. With a sigh, he dropped down from the footstool and went to his desk. Within moments, he'd removed and overturned each of his drawers to create a pile of documents, letters and notebooks in the middle of his study. The top of the desk held a collection of egg, cup and ball magic tricks, alongside sketches and handwritten notes for possible illusions. Standing upon the desk corner was a kerosene lamp that burnt at half strength. The curtains were drawn as a ferocious gale beat against the window panes and howled within the chimney breast. A fire wasn't lit in the iron hearth despite the chill of the November night air, yet a fine sheen of sweat covered Mr Locke's forehead regardless. He had watched the drawer's contents as they'd fallen, but had nonetheless failed to notice the long, narrow, two-inch deep case. The instant he glimpsed it, though, he dropped to his knees, plucked it from the rug of a cluster of papers, and fumbled to get it opened. All at once Percy felt relieved, excited, ashamed and giddy. His aching muscles, pounding head and tumultuous stomach became fiercer in their patience for the case's promised contents. It was no surprise then that he felt as if a horse and cart had travelled over him when he saw the case was empty. Light-headed and unbalanced, Percy dropped the case to hold his head and sit on his heels. He also sought out a static focal point to still his fevered vision. Choosing the ornate mantel clock, with its gold inlay detailing and hand-painted swamp face, Percy stared at the haze of dots and lines until they formed into Roman numerals. After a few moments, his focus shifted to the clock's rotund glass cover. In it, he saw his reflection and felt his chest tighten at the sight. The illusionist's once delicate, high cheekbones were now gaunt and severe, while dark rings had formed beneath his green eyes. His golden blonde curls were soaked with sweat and, like his sideburns, were extensive and unkempt. Such was the extent of his metamorphosis that Percy couldn't tolerate even the thought of it. Thus, after only a moment of looking, he snatched the case from the floor and threw it against the offensive vision. The glass cover was cracked upon impact and the case tumbled into the hearth with a clatter. I'm afraid I require more information than that, stated a woman in her late fifties as she peered over a brass-rimmed pince nez. She was attired in a high-necked, white cotton blouse, black skirt and scuffed heeled boots. Crow's feet were visible in the corners of her dark blue eyes, while her cheeks sagged. A slender neck laden down by folds of thin skin was hidden by the blouse's frilled collar. The pince nez were attached to a matching chain. The gentleman she had addressed was of average stature, but of slender form, with broad shoulders. Aged 21, Mr Joseph Maxwell had freckle-covered sunken cheeks and high cheekbones. His highly distinctive red hair was neatly combed and in a slight particle on the left. A hint of lavender and carbolic soap lingered about him. Long, ink-stained fingers absently rubbed his pale chin as he contemplated his reply. Art. Mr Maxwell cleared his throat and wiped his palms upon the skirt of his black frock coat. This was worn over a dark green waistcoat, high-collared white shirt and dark green silk cravat. The last had its tiny bow tied over his Adam's apple. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the subject and want to know more. The two stood on opposite sides of a waist-high oak-panelled counter surrounded by rows of multiple bookcases. Bright gaslight housed in wall-mounted frosted glass sconces illuminated the occasional group of tables amidst the shelves. Each table had wooden writing slopes whose centres were covered with green leather around their edges and double sconce kerosene lamps positioned in their middle. The dark stained exposed wooden floorboards were protected by rugs laid out beneath the tables. 
These rugs had elaborate Turkish inspired floor designs in a mixture of earthen shades. Barring an intermittent cough from one of the reading room's few early evening visitors, the only sounds were the tick of a clock and the occasional howl of the wind. The woman stifled her sneer as, irritated, she inquired, Do you wish to read about artists from the Renaissance period? The Baroque? Or Coco, perhaps? Um, Mr Maxwell? A familiar monotone inquired from his left. Mr Elliot? Mr Maxwell inquired as he tilted his head back a little to look into the sister's green-brown eyes. Elder than Mr Maxwell by seven years, Mr Gregory Elliot was beautiful rather than handsome. Fair, almost translucent skin graced a slender face. Very dark, almost black hair was kept short, whilst his cheeks, chin and upper lip were unfashionably clean-shaven. His stoic gaze and emotionless expression gave him a distinct air of gravitas, even when he was silent. A midnight blue frock coat covered a waistcoat of the same colour with cobalt blue floor embroidery. His midnight blue cravat was decorated with a silver pin that complemented the chain of his pocket watch. Tucked beneath one arm was a pile of books while his other hand gripped a black leather briefcase. What are you doing here? Mr Maxwell inquired. Expanding my knowledge, Mr Elliot glanced at the librarian. Did I overhear you quest some books on art? Oh yes, Mr Maxwell gave a weak smile. It wasn't my intended topic of research, but... He toyed with his cravat's bow. Miss Dexter, she's an artist, and I thought perhaps if I read about art, I could discuss it with her. I see. Mr Elliot thanked the librarian and, with Mr Maxwell's accompaniment, sat at a nearby table. Forgive me, but I thought you engaged to be married to a Miss Poppy Lillifwaite. I read of your impending nuptials in the newspaper. Yes, that's correct. Mr. Maxwell frowned. I had, um, intended to marry Miss Dexter. I'd asked her father's permission, much to her horror, I might add, but, well, circumstances conspired against us and I was compelled to withdraw my proposal. If Mr. Elliot was shocked by the revelations of his fellow Bow Street Society member, he didn't react to them. Instead, he put down his briefcase and books as he inquired, Then why are you keen to discuss matters of art with her? Mr. Maxwell's frown deepened. When he then shifted in his seat and wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, Mr. Elliot challenged, Are you unconvinced by the apparent merits of your impending nuptials? How did you... Mr. Maxwell retorted, stunned. It is plain to see for anyone with eyes. Mr. Maxwell swallowed hard and tore to his cravat once more. Yes, that is, I have my doubts, yes. To abandon Miss Lillifwaite will expose you to criminal proceedings. Mr. Elliot opened his briefcase and retrieved his notebook. Did Miss Dexter's father threaten you with court for breaching your promise to his daughter? Yes, but my father made arrangements to avoid it. A hint of disapproval appeared in Mr. Elliot's eyes. I would have expected you to have more respect for Miss Dexter than that. Pardon? Mr. Maxwell stared at him. I have ample respect for her. I love her. If that were true, you wouldn't be marrying another. Another whom would be within her legal right to demand punitive damages should you withdraw your proposal so close to the wedding day. But would she? But of course. Furthermore, your conduct and correspondence during your courtship with her would be exposed to the juries and the public gallery's scrutiny in the course of such proceedings. Why, if you love Miss Dexter, did you propose to Miss Lillifwaite? Is Miss Lillifwaite with child? Mr Maxwell blinked, no! At Mr Elliot's expectant eyes, he cleared his throat and wiped his palms upon his frock coat. It's complicated. My father has certain expectations. He mustn't be defied. Mr Elliot recalled an occasion when Mr Maxwell had attended a Bow Street Society meeting with a blackened eye. Though he made an assumed connection between it and Mr. Maxwell Sr., he didn't say it aloud. I begin to understand the difficult position you've placed yourself in. Nonetheless, there are several questions you must consider the answers to before you take any action. First, does Miss Dexter share your affections? Second, 
If she does, will she accept another proposal of marriage from you? Third, has Miss Lillifrite other suitors she could marry instead? Fourth, should you withdraw your proposal to Miss Lillifrite and Miss Dexter refuses marriage, is your reputation sufficient enough to convince a third lady to accept a proposal from you? Mr. Maxwell's stomach lurched as the weight of his predicament pressed against his heart and mind. I, I would like to hope Miss Dexter is still fond of me, but I have treated her cruelly, and she deserves a finer gentleman than me. As for Miss Lillifrite, she has no other suitors and, and has become a burden to her family. He swallowed hard and cast his eyes downward. I couldn't imagine marrying anyone other than Miss Dexter. Mr. Elliot took the first book in his pile and, opening it, began to make notes. Then you must take responsibility for your past mistakes and decide upon the best course of action. I can't give you the answer, Mr. Maxwell. Only you can do that. Mr. Maxwell swallowed hard but gave a brief nod. Yes, you're right. Thank you, Mr. Elliot. He rose from his seat. I'll leave you to your studies. Good night. He then rubbed his sweat-covered hands together as, with a deep frown, he wandered from the library. Six o'clock. Inspector Caleb Wolf closed his pocket watch and put it away while he wiped the underside of his red nose with a large finger. A subsequent attempt to sniff was thwarted by excessive mucus that then threatened to slip down his throat. He coughed, tried a harder sniff, and coughed again. In his late forties, Wolf was six foot tall, broad-chested, and solidly built. These characteristics, alongside his unkempt black hair, bushy eyebrows, and leather-like skin, had earned him the nickname Big Bad Wolf among policemen and criminal alike. He picked up the evening edition of the Gaslight Gazette and squinted at it with bloodshot brown eyes. Sitting behind an immense desk, with a sash window overlooking Bow Street to his right, Wolf had turned down the gaslight in anticipation of leaving his office. Housed on the second floor of the police station, its space was restricted. In addition to the desk was a coat stand by the back wall and a squat chair opposite Wolf's, the last of which complained as he shifted his weight. It was a snug fit for him regardless on account of his broad frame. An ubiquitous odour of mustiness had been a part of his office for as long as Wolf could remember. He then noticed a sudden scent of lavender in the air when the door was opened. You're bloody late, he growled. A good evening to you too, the rich yet smooth voice of Inspector Lee replied. It was followed by the door closing and Lee's footfall against the wooden floor as he crossed the office to sit. Wolf dropped the newspaper and met his gaze when he heard the creak of Lee's chair. Inspector Gideon Lee of the Metropolitan Police's T or Kensington Division was a gentleman in his late fifties with striking dark blue eyes, a flawless fair complexion and short salt and pepper hair. Though identical to Wolf in height, he wasn't as broad. A further difference was the cut and quality of their attire. Whilst Wolf's dark grey suit, white shirt and black tie were made for general consumption, Lee's forest green suit, with a waistcoat and tie to match, was tailored for him. Is there any news of our mutual enemy? Lee inquired. Nah, and there's not going to be. I've heard nothing about them, not from Conway or elsewhere, since you let the press know you solved the Cosgrove case a month ago. Are you suggesting I shouldn't have done so, Inspector? It would have given people cause to hire the society. As it is, the last major case the Bow Street Society solved was mine, the Oxford Street one. Wolf prodded his chest as he spoke. Retrieving a bottle of whisky from the bottom drawer of his desk, he poured a couple of fingers worth and tossed it down his throat. Is that why you want me to put off my dinner, Lee? Lee smirked. I would not tolerate your company otherwise. He leaned back into the chair's corner and rested one hand top the other upon his thigh. Miss Rebecca Trent, the clerk of the Bosch Society, what do you know about her? Wolf shrugged. Not much. Before society had their house on Bow Street, it had an office on Endor Street. His eyes narrowed. Are you thinking we should investigate her? Why not? Lee inquired in a nonchalant tone. 
She is the driving force behind the society, and yet we know next to nothing about her, where she was born, who her friends and family are, and where she was employed prior to becoming society's clerk. These are all key pieces of information we must uncover if we're to damage society's reputation. Wolf's smile was filled with stained yellow teeth. Disgrace her, disgrace the group. His smile broadened. I like it. I like it a lot. He took another glass from his desk and placed it before Lee. While he poured them some whiskey, he continued, As we have the Endor Street lead, and only that, to go on, we should start there. Maybe it's the same landlord and he can tell us how she came to vent the office. Inspector Lee lifted his glass with a self-satisfied smirk. But of course. The two tapped their glasses and while Wolf tossed back his whiskey, Lee drank his in two mouthfuls. Chapter 1 Please remind me why I'm holding this, Miss Rebecca Trent said. She stood half-turned toward the window, with a bright red apple held to her lips. That arm, her right to be precise, was bent, its elbow held aloft while her other hand rested upon her hip. Her attire consisted of an ankle-length brown bustle skirt with several ruffled layers and a russet-coloured cream-spotted long-sleeved blouse with dark brown lace on its cuffs. The natural curve of her slender waist was accentuated by her tight corset and the blouse's close fit. Roses, also of dark brown lace, lined the blouse's round neckline. Aged 28, her fair complexion was flawless whilst the natural red of her lips complemented the apple. Her shoulder-length chestnut brown hair rested in part between her shoulder blades and in part atop her head in an elaborate mass of tight pinned curls. Though she was a natural 5 foot 7 inches in height, her hairstyle and elevation on an upturned soapbox made her appear much taller. Its vibrant colour, against the background of browns and greens, should leap from the canvas to catch the eye. Miss Georgina Dexter applied from behind an easel. Her petite, delicate face then peered around it. Tilt your head a little, please. Once Miss Trent had done as she'd asked, she smiled and returned to her painting. Thank you. At 18, Miss Dexter was one of the Bowstry Society's youngest members yet her petite five-foot stature was in perfect proportion in spite of her age. Attired in rich plum high-waist straight-lined skirts and a loose-fitting cream blouse with mutton leg sleeves, Miss Dexter had foregone her habit of pinning up her red hair. Instead, it was formed into two plaits which were hung behind her ears and tied with plum ribbon. Though it was mid-morning, dense cloud cover had blotted out the sun to create a gleam within the room. As a result, Miss Dexter's hair appeared dark brown while her fair complexion was rendered almost pallid. The room is sufficient then? Miss Trent inquired. Most certainly, Miss Dexter replied with a bounce to her voice. To begin with, I haven't Mama intruding upon me every hour of the day. She recalled from the canvas, brush in hand, and clutched her bosom. That sounded ever so ungrateful. Calm yourself. Miss Trent lowered the apple and approached the artist. I'm certain your mother knows you appreciate all she's done for you. At the same time, you're now a grown woman with strong ambition. It's only natural you'd want some space for yourself. Besides, this is only your studio. It's not as if you've left home. Miss Dexter relaxed beneath her friend's hand. Yes, you're right. She glanced at a dishevelled cot in the corner. And I only stay when it's too late to travel home. And you telephone your parents and inform them of the facts so they don't worry. Miss Trent added with a lift of her index finger. When she felt Miss Dexter relax further, she gave her upper arm the gentle rub and returned to her place by the window. Now, this portrait shan't paint itself. Miss Dexter chuckled but nonetheless retreated behind her canvas. Her studio was located in a former bedroom on the first floor of the Bow Street Society's house. The previous owner's taste remained in the form of Nile green, embossed flock wallpaper and brass chandelier. The latter held tall, unused candles covered in dust. Four gas lamps, with sconces which resembled clear glass roses, were mounted upon the wall opposite the modest oak fireplace and window. The room's singular door was also on the latter. Prior to its current function, the late bedroom had been unoccupied and unfurnished. Similar to the other first four rooms, Miss Trent had entered it on rare occasions, 
dust, it had been covered in dust until Miss Dexter had swept it out and filled the space with artistic and photographic paraphernalia. Wait a moment, I hear someone at the front door. Miss Trent stepped off her soapbox. It may be a client, so would you stay here until I fetch you? Of course. Miss Dexter gestured toward the canvas. I have to paint the background anyway. Thank you. Miss Trent lifted her skirt and hurried onto the landing. I'll return as soon as possible. Miss Dexter followed Miss Trent to the studio door and, as she descended the stairs, peered over the landing's balustrade. She watched her until she had crossed the hallway, but returned to her studio when she saw her release the front door's numerous locks and bolts. A lady with worn, fatigued features was revealed to be stood on the porch when Miss Trent opened the door. Miss Trent's initial estimation of her age placed her in the late fifties, yet she was obliged to revise this to late thirties the moment she saw her eyes. The utter intensity of their honey-coloured irises arose from youth rather than wisdom. When she scrutinised the remainder of her visitor's appearance, Miss Trent forgave herself for the earlier mistake. The lady's dark bronze hair resembled wire in both form and texture, whilst the bonnet formed was unkempt and riddled with grey. Her complexion, washed out and dry as it was, did little to alleviate the illusion of middle age. In stark contrast to her physical condition was her attire, a duck egg blue bustle dress with a hand embroidered central panel of silver and cream roses and a black fur coat, both of which were tailor made to the highest grade of workmanship. Good morning, I'm Mrs. Floretta Belrose. Are these the headquarters of the Bonesy Society? Yes, they are. I'm Miss Rebecca Trent, the society's clerk. An absolute pleasure it is to make your acquaintance, Miss Trent. Mrs. Belrose extended her lean hand. Thank you. Miss Trent gave her hand a brief squeeze and stepped back to open the door wide. Please come in. Mrs. Belrose stepped over the threshold, removed her coat and held it out to Miss Trent. The hallway had six additional doors, two on the left, two on the right, and one on either side of the grand staircase in the middle. All were closed. The furniture consisted of a noble grandfather clock between the doors on the right, a two-seat sofa between the doors on the left, a hat stand with an umbrella pan in the corner to one's right, and a chair to one's left. A black and white checked tiled floor, embossed wallpaper with a repetitive burgundy floor pattern on a light red background, and a plush burgundy carpet on the stairs formed the rest of the decor. Miss Trent gave Mrs. Belrose and her coat a single glance before she gestured to her right. You may hang your coat on the hat stand. Mrs. Belrose at once retracted her arm and glowered at the clerk. And join me by the fire in the parlour, Miss Trent added as she passed the hat stand and entered the first door on the left. Mrs. Belrose clutched her coat against her for several moments. When the clerk didn't return, she marched to the stand, hooked her coat onto it, and marched to the still open door to the parlour. Miss Trent stood in front of an armchair that faced her guest. It was a twin of a high, triple balloon shaped back tete a tete sofa that faced a lit half on the wall to Mrs. Belrose's left. A low oak table with curved legs and feet resembling paws, known as Queen Anne feet, stood before the sofa upon a rug. The previously mentioned half was made of black iron. It had an oak surround of hand carved floor embellishments down each side and a flat mantel shelf on top. Bronze gilt paper with a light blue leaf design covered the walls whilst the floorboards were polished. Other items in the parlour were a taxidermy herring housed in a glass case on a table behind the door and a bookcase against the back right corner. The latter held books by Charles Dickens, amongst others, and a music box that played notched brass discs. An oil painting of Hampstead Heath hung upon the chimney breast, while smaller framed prints of flowers and countryside scenes filled the wall between the door and the fireplace. Do you... Mrs. Belrose began in an irate tone. Please be seated so we may discuss the particulars of your case, Miss Trent interrupted in a firm but polite manner. I beg your pardon? Mrs. Belrose inquired in a hushed voice as she recoiled from the door. Miss Trent lofted a brow at the sight. Is something the matter? Only my naivety. Mrs. Belrose pursed her lips a moment. So much time has passed, I assumed it wouldn't be remembered. I'm afraid I don't know what you're referring to. Unless you're telling me the matter you wish to discuss happened some years ago. Mrs. Belrose stared at her. You don't? She shook her head. No, that's not the reason for my visit. Forgive me. 
It was a long cab ride to reach you, and I'm not in the prime of health at the best of times. She gave a feeble smile. May I sit, please? Of course. Miss Trent indicated the sofa. While Miss Bellrose perched upon its edge, Miss Trent retrieved a notebook and pencil from the mantel shelf and took the armchair. Would you like some tea? I have a bottle of brandy in the pantry too. No, thank you. I'm quite well now. Mrs. Bellrose slid back on the sofa to rest against his overstuffed cushion. My heart is rather weak. I mustn't become too excited. Miss Trent remained silent in the hope a visitor would feel obliged, like others before her, to fill the gap. Mrs. Bellrose went against the grain, though, in that she waited for Miss Trent to speak instead. With the realisation she had gleaned no further information on the topic of her visitor's health, Miss Trent inquired, What is the matter you wish the Bow Street Society to investigate, then? Do you recall, in 1889, the trial of Mrs. Florence Maybrick for the murder of her husband? Yes, it caused quite a sensation both during the proceedings and afterward. Didn't the Home Secretary intervene on her behalf? Mrs. Bellrose hummed and leaned toward Miss Trent a moment. Indeed! Alas, poor Mrs. Maybrick remains in prison despite the majority of polite society believing she was unfairly treated at her trial. I mean, the jury had some of her husband's acquaintances on it, for, good, for heaven's sake. Miss Trent set aside her notebook and pencil. However unjust her trial may have been, the Bow Street Society can't reverse the court's decision, nor can it embark upon a fresh investigation unless Mrs. Maybrook, or someone close to her like an intimate friend or relative, commissions it to do so. Yet, even under those circumstances, I would be loath to assign our members to the task of proving Mrs. Maybrook's innocence. You have done so before. True. But the case had yet to be heard in court, and the Bow Street Society had been involved with the investigation from the beginning. I thought this was a group that seeks justice for all. Was I mistaken? No, but this particular matter is beyond our authority, Mrs. Belrose. But the least it could do is petition for Mrs. Maybrick's release. Why? It didn't exist at the time of her trial. Any campaigning it would do on her behalf would be construed as an act of publicity for itself. The Bow Street Society has higher values than that. Mrs. Belrose stood. This is indecent. That poor woman has lost her liberty because of a jury's bias, and the Bow Street Society will do nothing. Miss Trent stood. Mrs. Belrose, I have explained the society's position. However, if you wish to hear them from someone more qualified in criminal law than I, I may put the request to one of our members whose usual occupation is that of a solicitor. Please do. Mrs. Bellrose went to the door. We may meet for luncheon at the Wormsley Hotel in St. James's Street at one thirty today with Mrs. Payton, a fellow campaigner and member of the Women's International Maybrook Association. Miss Trent placed her hand upon her hip. I will put the request to him, but I can give no guarantee he'll accept, nor will I attempt to persuade him to do so. Mrs. Bellrose smiled as she lifted her chin in triumph. If he's a decent man... He'll accept, and as he's a member of your fine society, he must be a decent man. Good day to you, Miss Trent. Duncan Terrace, Islington, thus named for the first Viscount Duncan of Camperdown, Admiral Adam Duncan, who lived 1731 to 1804, began its existence in 1791. Arguably, its most famous residents were writers and siblings Charles and Mary Lamb, who occupied Colbrook Cottage by the New River. By 1896, Duncan Terrace had absorbed properties from New Terrace on Colbrook Row and Camden Terrace. To Mr Joseph Maxwell, though, Duncan Terrace was his boyhood home. The family had moved there in 1880 from Edinburgh when he was five, and his brothers were 12 and 14 respectively. The former had entered the clergy in 1890 and now served at the Church of St John the Evangelist on Duncan Terrace, whereas his eldest brother had been taken into his father's company and taught the ways of business. The parents had remained on Duncan Terrace after they'd left home, yet, despite Jace's career at the Gaslight Gazette and rented lodgings near Fleet Street, his marital home was to be on Duncan Terrace. 
The mortgage rates are reasonable on this property. Mr Oliver Maxwell stated as he addressed Mr Roger Lillifwaite in the narrow, unfurnished hallway of number 164. Oliver was in his mid-fifties with defined cheekbones and jaw, high forehead, slanted salt and pepper eyebrows and a receding hairline. The retained hair had been parted off centre, with his natural black colour remaining at the sides of his head. Small salt and pepper patches were still visible though not only above his ears, but at the edge of his hairline and parting. The weight of his brow and droop in the corners of his mouth made him appear dissatisfied even when at rest. Roger, by contrast, was a plump gentleman of six feet. His once black hair was now a dark grey, but had remained full-bodied. Hazel-coloured eyes peered out from behind swollen cheeks and brow. His attire, while inferior in cut and quality to Oliver's, consisted of a black frock coat with matching trousers, a forest green waistcoat, white shirt and black cravat. His wealth was denoted by the silk handkerchief he wore in his waistcoat pocket and the gold watch chain that lay across his rotund stomach. A curt nod of approval was given to Oliver's words, followed by his booming voice as he replied, And your wife is also on hand to instruct Poppy on how to run a household. The girl is ignorant to a fault and beyond, sir. All women are when they're young, Oliver replied, but firm words and firm actions are usually sufficient means of correction. Indeed! Joseph gazed out of the parlour window. It had never struck him before how quiet Duncan Terrace was. One wouldn't think one was amidst the sprawl of London. True, Mr Lillifwaite and his father made it difficult to enjoy the peace. He released a slow, deep breath and turned on the spot. The room had a high ceiling, a fireplace and little else. It was one of three on the ground floor, as far as he understood it from his father's early description, with the other two being the breakfast and dining rooms. The kitchen and pantry were housed in the basement, while there was room enough for a cook and parlours made accommodation in the attic. Two guest bedrooms and a study were on the second floor, while the third held the master bedroom, nursery and nanny's bedroom. The anticipated budget allocated to the purchase of the home couldn't stretch to a bathroom or indoor plumbing, however. One point in the house's favour was the inclusion of electric lighting, a luxury Joseph had yet to enjoy at his lodgings. Poppy Lillifwaite stood with one hand upon the plaster surround of the wrought iron hearth as she leaned forward to study its detail. Her build was stockier than his despite being around the same height. Broad shoulders, a full waist and wide hips were smothered by a maroon bustle dress with innumerable folds and layers. Waist-length jet black hair had been tied into two plaits, pulled back in a loop and pinned to either side of her crown. Rather than beautiful or even handsome, her face could best be described as masculine due to her angular brow, oversized nose and cleft chin. At 33, she was also 12 years Joseph Senior. Shall we look around the rest of the house? Oliver suggested. But of course, Roger replied and the two gentlemen strolled down the hallway to the breakfast room. After a moment, Roger's voice inquired in the distance, And it's quite secure. I notice there's only a brick wall around the garden. Oliver's reply was too muffled for Joseph to hear. Bobby, meanwhile, had wandered over to the window. The house is beautiful. Her impish voice had become a source of discomfort to Joseph due to it being at such odds with her appearance. It was as if another woman spoke on Bob's behalf. Do you have any preference for wallpaper, dear? Pardon? He looked at the faded, peeling cream and brown floral wallpaper. Oh, no. I'll be satisfied with whatever you think is best. His gaze drifted to the chimney breast. No, I think a painting should hang above the hearth. As he stared at the empty space, he imagined one of Miss Dexter's artworks there. That is, the style of artwork he imagined she'd paint. To his shame, he had yet to see her pieces. Based upon the sketches she'd made for the Bosch Society in the past, though, he was certain they'd be quite breathtaking. He turned to face the room again and thought... Georgina would undoubtedly have a fine eye for interior decoration. He smiled as he imagined Miss Dexter working in the parlour, paintbrush in hand with her easel by the window. The sunshine, when there was sunshine of course, catching her air to give her a divine halo. People in the street would slow down once they'd see her, a vision of loveliness in the midst of London's filth. Mr Elliot's voice then drifted in Joseph's mind. Does Miss Dexter share your affections? Will she accept another proposal of marriage from you? 
Do you have an artist in mind? Poppy's voice penetrated his consciousness. No. Joseph cleared his throat and clasped his hands behind his back while he went to the door. We should join our fathers. Rather than allow her to leave the parlour first, though, he instead strode into the hallway and sought out Oliver Maxwell in the breakfast room with Roger. As he did so, Mr Elliot's words drifted back into his thoughts. You must take responsibility for your past mistakes and decide upon the best course of action. I can't give you the answer, Mr Maxwell. Only you can do that. Joseph swallowed hard and toyed with his cravat once he'd found a corner to stand in. A perplexed and morose Poppy came into the breakfast room a moment later, but neither Roger nor Oliver acknowledged her. The two remained engrossed in their discussion, while Joseph appeared distracted by his thoughts. She released a soft, inaudible sigh and went to the window to see the view. She was disappointed to discover it was similar to the other. Unbeknownst to her, Joseph had watched her cross the room to the window. She's relying on me, he thought, and recalled what she'd said when he'd given her the ring. We both wear the marks of our father's will. He ran his gaze over the vacant room as Poppy's voice echoed in his mind again. But now, isn't it enough to sleep soundly in the home of our own? At those last five words, his vision of Miss Dexter by the window filled his mind's eye. A home of our own? His inner voice said as he imagined putting his arms around her and hearing her say, A home of our own, in the moment before they kissed. Elias will be eager to visit once Poppy is settled, Roger remarked. Joseph's vision disappeared and he was pulled back to reality in an instant. Oliver hummed. Yes, it was fortunate the church could accommodate the wedding a few weeks earlier than planned. Indeed, Roger boomed. Poppy is most fond of her uncle. He rubbed his hands together. Shall we move on to the rest of the house, sir? Yes, I think so, Oliver replied. Come, Joseph. You too, Poppy, Roger interjected as he followed Oliver from the room. Joseph indicated for Poppy to go ahead of him and, with a glance back at the unfinished dining room, resolved to pay a visit to Miss Dexter.